Good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda Clark, or Amanda Ball. I'm with The Novel Neighbor. Welcome to our event. Um, we are an independent bookstore in St. Louis, Missouri, and we are really excited that you're all here tonight. Um, this evening, we have our special guests, Paul Tremblay and Sarah Langan. Um, Paul is the winner of the Bram Stoker, the British Fantasy, and Massachusetts Book Awards. He is the author of numerous books, including his crime novels, The Little Sleep, and No Sleep to Wonderland, which we highly recommend to those attending tonight. Um, he is currently a member of the board of directors of the Shirley Jackson Awards. Sarah grew up on Long Island, but now lives in Los Angeles. Aside from her MFA in creative writing, she also has a master's in environmental health science and toxicology. She has written numerous books, including The Keeper and The Missing, and is a three-time winner for the Bram Stoker Award. Her newest novel, which we'll be discussing tonight, Good Neighbors, has been described by NPR as one of the creepiest, most unnerving deconstructions of American suburbia I've ever read. That's a pretty good, it's a pretty good review then. Again, we're excited to have them here, excited to have you here, and we're excited to listen to them, see what this conversation holds. So please join me in welcoming Paul Tremblay and Sarah Langan. Hi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I was paid to do that. No. <laughs> Just a little. How you doing? What you drinking? I'm good. I'm drinking green tea because uh, I live in California. No, it's good. It's good. Well, it's green also it's early enough to still drink tea. Like I yeah. could drink it now, but it would probably keep me up. Yeah. Yeah. This is going really well so far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my one little just like administrative announcement is if I am desperate enough to go to my readers, if you see me switching glasses, it's all just because I, I didn't feel like I could learn how to do bifocals. So I have regular glasses and reading glasses, you know, cause I wrote down the questions I have to ask just, just so excited. people know. I'm excited. <laughs> I think we should <laughs> Make do screenshots read. of the changes. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, I wanted to start with, I don't know. I'm sure you've already been asked this question a bunch, but I'm interested because I got to read the novel, I think, early on. Um, I'm not sure how early it was in the drafting process. And then I you know, just reread the finished copy. I was like, this is the same book. I am just kidding. No, <laughs> it, it, it was amazing. Um, yeah, because I, I want to know. I mean, I want to know what inspired like the story initially. What was the kernel sort of which part came first uh, or any, any anything or all that you'd be willing to talk about like that of that? Well First, I just want to say um, how glad I am that you're doing it, this, and what an honor it is. Um, and you've been really supportive of my career for a long time. And I'm really, I'm really honored. And oh, uh, so for people who don't know, uh, when I set my manuscript out on submission, like Paul's a big name. And so I asked him to give me a blurb even before an editor, like editors were looking at it. And that really helped with the sale and it got attention going. Oh, wow. And people don't do that. You know, you don't ask people, that's a huge ask to be like, oh, my, can you read my unsolicited, my un <laughs> unpublished manuscript and give me a blurb? So that was big. And, you know, you and I have been publishing kind of at the same time for a long right. time. You know, I think we both started it. Churrascuro was my second publication ever. Oh, wow. Um, and you were publishing at the same time. And yeah, you know, I've, I've always time. really admired your work. So, oh, well, thank um, you. And same. You're going to make me blush. But yeah. no, I mean, your, your, work's, your work is the best. Uh, love all of it. Um, <laughs> it was fun. Let me say really quickly, because you reminded me. Like so, But you did it like, you know, I, I've read your work. I loved it. And I was more than happy to read your manuscript. That was like a very good way to do that. I did what you did when I was a nobody. Like I had this novel and my plan was, you know what? I'm going to try to get pre blurbs. This was in 2003, 2004. And I actually got uh, <laughs> Stuart O'Nan to read it. And uh, at the time, Poppy Z. Bright, who's now, you know, Billy Martin. Whoa. You know, both of them read it. Uh, you know, I Billy, went after Poppy and Poppy was like, no. <laughs> yeah, she, she had happened to read a short story of yeah. mine on like gothic.net back in the day. So I had a little bit of a relationship with her. But Stuart was totally out of the blue. I faxed him because <laughs> he was on, he was listed on the HWA Horror Writers Association website, but no email. It was a fax number. That's how long ago it was. And I faxed. I'm like, hey, oh my God. sorry to bother you. And like he answered. What a, like a cool guy. Anyway, 
Uh, please don't fax me. I don't have a fax number. <laughs> so, but anyway, so let's talk good neighbors. Like that's the kernel, the start. Like, uh, uh, so, um, I, it was actually my fourth book. Clinic was my fifth book. So good neighbors, um, started as a book called empty houses. And I had had Clem, my daughter in 2011. And then I kind of took a year and, and when she was a baby, and wasn't ready. And then I wrote the first half of what I then called the empty houses and would later be called good neighbors. And it was this giant cul-de-sac and this like asteroid hits and a monster is in it. And then like, it was, it was in a huge, like all those characters in the book had their own chapters and had their whole own. I mean, it, it could have been like a thousand pages long, but it's anyway. So I got into like 200 pages and it kind of blew up as, as plots blow up sometimes when you're writing them. And uh, and I just couldn't figure it out. And then I had Francis in 2000, no, oh, I had Clem in 2009, then I had Franny in 2011. And then I took another year off. And then I was like, I don't really know how to write this book, uh, Empty Houses. So I started a different book and I wrote that one. Hmm. And then um, I went back to Empty Houses and thought, you know, what if I kind of had a revelation just as a parent and as a human, I think, in the ways that I deal with conflict and kind of the person that I am. And uh, it affected the story. And so I looked back and I thought, what if there is no monster? What if, what if it's just about um, relationships between people? And there's a specific relationship between these two women um, that could have been beautiful. Um, they really could have been supports for each other because they're both outsiders and they're both um, thinkers, even though Gertie doesn't seem like one. Um, and But because of their, their wounds and the things they're carrying with them and the conversations they're having with ghosts, with things that aren't even there, um, that relationship is destroyed. And um, and then I thought, what about on a larger level? Um, because I was seeing it myself. You know, I was seeing these behaviors. You know, when you hit middle age, you're like, I seem to overreact sometimes. You know, <laughs> and I, don't, yeah. I don't think it's about the current conversation. And so. Uh, so I put that and it was painful. It was like a painful personal thing, but it was also, mm. you know, as, as all growth is, um, I thought so much more relevant to our world right now. And so it was, you know, these personal relationships that go wrong and then these communal relationships that go wrong. And then, you know, I've, I've had this relationship with social media and that I hate it. Um, it's necessary, but I hate it. And I think it sort of drives, um, these miscommunications between people because it really, it speaks to our ids, not our, not our overt personalities. And, uh, it interacts with our, our fear responses. So, um, so I really wanted to talk about that. Um, and I think once I figured that out, you know, I'd been like sitting around stewing and writing the same characters over and over as you do. And you're like, this is a great section. <laughs> this section works. Yeah. So, you know, the book didn't work. Once I figured that out, I just, I pretty much started over and uh, it took me six months and it was done. And then I gave it to you. Uh, <laughs> I, I had no idea it had such a, yeah, wow. Um, you know, that history of, you know, the asteroid in particular with the monster. Um, oh, that's cool. Was, yeah, because it's funny, when I first read the book, I, I, I do have a follow-up question, but I'm thinking of the book where, and this isn't a huge spoiler if people have read it, haven't read it, um, but there's this, Moment in the, I'll just say there's a moment in the book fairly early on. I was like, like the way there isn't. Um, it, it, when I say down there in the in the in the in the pit in the sinkhole. Uh, so so anyway, but I want to when you said the monster, I was like, okay. Uh, so let me ask this: since you mentioned you know things that you've learned about yourself, you know, as a as a parent, as a mother, um, you know, I, I don't know. I've written a lot about. <laughs> Being a parent in, in my own work, it's always been sort of an anxiety or, or a thing that I've, I've written about very frequently. 
And I do think you sort of, it brings out the best of you and the absolute worst of you. Um, and so you, you can only see it from like somewhat of a distance, even in the moment you can kind of see it, but then you have to forget about it or you can't, you're not going to be able to go on or move on. At least, you know, in my case, you know, it's, and I do find it's helped to write about it a little bit. Sorry, it's go ahead. It's yeah. terrifying. Cause you, I'm sorry. I, I got a little mm. quiet because you, um, you went in and out and oh, I, was no. like I was texting yeah. JT to be like, get the kids <laughs> off the internet. <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, I, it's, it's terrifying because like, you know, there's things you don't want to re reproduce. There's behaviors you don't want to have, and then you have them, you know, right. and it's, and it's, uh, and you don't see them. And, right. you know, actually seeing them is, is shocking. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah. But then there's also like, there's, there's real threats in the world. And I think, so it's this intersection of, of, you, our children are the things we love most or the people, the people in our lives are, because there's plenty of people who don't have kids and, you know, right. it's, it's not just about that, sure. but the people, what we've made our family and threats to them um, are terrifying. And there are real threats to them, um, but are the ones we imagine are the, are the most immediate threats, actually the most immediate threats. Right. And I think um, I think in this this media society uh, where there's just there's no long form journalism anymore um, that it's just like what did this guy say what did that guy say what did this guy say let's kill them all you know it's it's like you know you're just you're on high alert and you don't know what's real you know there's yeah. how many serial killers are there in the world not a lot. You know, right. there's, it's no. not really a reason to be scared of a serial killer. Probably a reason to be scared of guns in schools, yeah. you know. No, absolutely. I mean, everything is sold on fear. Uh, the, the book's a little bit dated now, but I read something called The Science of Fear. It's probably, it's probably more than 10 years old at this point, but it opened up talking about how a year after 9-11, uh, it took a full year for, for Americans to return to normal uh, flying patterns within the country because, you know, the fear of terrorism. Um, you know, with the death of 3000 people and yeah. within a couple of years, they were able to estimate by traffic patterns that, you know, there was an extra like five to 6,000 auto fatalities <laughs> because of more people driving as opposed to flying. Um, right. but you know, the human brain is just not meant to, uh, it, it's not wired to, it's not wired to, to dissect what risk is when it's, especially when it's complex, you know, it's all so lizard brained, whereas, you know, like comparing driving, just compare driving to flying. If one plane crashed per day, like every day, you know, just if it, if that happened, yeah. if a plane crashed every day, it would still be far safer to fly than it would be to drive. But we can't wrap our heads around those numbers because we drive, or most of us drive every day. Uh, and but but like the confirmation bias is like, oh, I drive and I'm fine, but it's actually quite risky. Uh, I don't want to make people afraid of driving. Sorry, <laughs> I'm bumming everybody out with my math statistics. No, I think, but that's the thing is, is I actually think our brains are capable if we actually knew the statistics, but having right. the data out there isn't right. There's so many things that if we, we had the numbers behind, we could actually have answers to, but. Um, so I'm going to ask you a little bit about uh, Rhea and Gertie, uh, because it is such an honest portrayal of parenting and motherhood. Uh, you know, some of, especially the dark thoughts and actions that parents have. And I always appreciate when I feel like when I say bravery in terms of a piece of artwork, I'm not talking about like real life bravery, but like the idea that a piece of art will be brave enough to sort of tell the truth about the good and bad about parenting. And you know, I think a movie like The Babadook to me is so painfully honest about what it feels like, you know, to be a parent, you know, probably more specifically, you know, to be a mother. Um, I don't know. I found both Gertie and Rhea to be also, you know, so heartbreaking, but also like I would recoil from the, like, you know, what people, the worst things she's actually physically abusing, you know, her kids. Yeah. But, you know, the scene where, where Gertie sort of just leaves Julie to, to, to deal with what she knew wasn't a good thing. I was like, oh, I mean, that, that felt like so in, in a weird way, almost worse than anything else that ends up happening later. Um, that, yeah, sorry, go ahead. That I didn't come to until late, um, in the book and, uh, or in revision process. 
And because I didn't want to do it, you know, like it didn't occur to me, but Mm. also like being a mother has so many, um, uh, external notions of what a good mother is. And the expectation is that we're supposed to be perfect. And if we're not, we better pretend we are because somebody's going to give us a lot of shit about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the truth of this is that we're completely flawed, that we screw up all the time, then we're not always doing the right things by our children. And we need to be, we do, you know, that's the intention. I don't think there's anyone, I've never met a person who doesn't wildly, madly love their children more than they love themselves. So, so where is this disconnect happening? And I think it's really unfair that mothers can't say like, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. I didn't do this right. right. And it's, it's really hard to do. And it's not because it's internally hard. It's because socially, um, it's just not acceptable to not be a perfect mom. And so like, I think Gertie is an excellent mother. And I think we all do these things to our children Mm. all the time. We just don't aren't aware of it. We don't talk about it. It doesn't come up. So what Paul's referring to is that Gertie just when she comes from a place where when she was growing up, she was abused badly enough. And the book doesn't get into that abuse, that she's unable to parse any kind of conflict or angry emotions. And when they happen, she shuts down. She's just gone. And it's it's as if, you know, it, this does happen psychologically, is as if it's not happening. Like you might remind her later, remember when that happened, and she'll, she wouldn't quite be sure. So what happens is she forces her kids to go play out with the other kids because it's hot inside. And the kids um, wind up in a bad situation where the rest of the neighborhood is turning against them and saying nasty things and yelling at them. And Gertie uh, freezes. She's like, I should get out of the car. I should I should help my kids. I don't know how. I don't know what to do. I maybe I'm going to make it worse. Maybe I'm not going to like I just don't know what to do. And I come from East New York and this is fancy suburbia, you know, whatever the rules are here, clearly I don't get them. So she just keeps driving. And Julia's like, oh, my mom, (laughs) she's the worst. You know, she just abandons me. She doesn't care about me. But in my mind, Gertie is thinking about it all day. And she's like, yeah, that was the right thing. I just, you know, kids are supposed to handle things themselves, right? And you don't get in their way and you just, you let it go and no one ever helped me. And and then by the middle of the book, she's like, I don't think I did the right thing. You know, it's like, it, it like keeps popping up, which is, mm-hmm. I think, what a lot of parenting is. And, and it's a why parenting is so painful. And I think it's why it's the most real moment in the book is because it's that, you, you have to change for the people you love. You know when you did something wrong and it's awful, you know? Right. So, yeah. But I mean, I've gotten a lot of like, none of the characters are likable. Uh. And I think like, I just, I think it's so unforgiving of a human being to, to, to not say like, well, yeah, yeah. But you went back. Like, I think the whole thing about what I like, what I want in my characters is for them to, to, to screw up, but then to keep trying. Right. I, yeah. I mean, that's a whole other thing. Like the idea of likable characters. I mean, it just sets my teeth on edge. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is you know, obviously just my opinion, but you know, too often I think like people like on oh, that character is not likable translates to oh, that person doesn't think or act or look like me. Um, like that's the idea of sympathy is rooting for the home team. You know, I think sympathy is why, <laughs> our country is in a, you know, world of hurt as opposed to empathy, you know, the want to understand what this person is doing, even if you may not agree with it. I mean, to me, that's the more, that's the harder thing to do. That's the more human thing to do. And, you know, that's what I try for in fiction. And I clearly you do as well. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do. I like, I come to it. Like I imagine, I don't imagine other people. I kind of constantly imagine myself Mm -hmm. in other circumstances. Is that how you do it? Yeah. Or do you do? Yeah. Like I don't, when there are people are like, were you inspired by someone else? I'm like, 
who like that seems <laughs> kind of like an invasion of privacy. I don't think I would yeah. go there anyway. Uh, I, I take phys- people's physicalness. Like I've put friends, like my friend Chris Irvin. Do you know Chris? You know, I made him a character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not really him, but physically it's him. So I do that. But oh yeah, every character starts with a piece of me. And then hopefully, you know, the book poses them enough questions that they become their own their own thing or their own yeah. character at some point. Um, all right, let me ask, because uh, now that we talked about Julia, you know, so in this book, there, you know, you do this amazing balancing act with the adult drama. And for the most part, you know, it really seems like the adult drama is way spinning out of control. And when you first meet the teens or, or the kids of, of, uh, of Garden City, um, you know, it opens with what you described as like, ah, it's almost like a Lord of the Flies situation potentially. But then they, fi- they do figure it out and they actually, you know, are there and sort of support each other. You know, and it's definitely not done in like a corny, um, you know, corny sentimental way. You know, because the kids definitely have their shit together, <laughs> you know, comparatively to the adults. So I don't know. I mean, was that something you went in purposely thinking or is that just something that happened more like as you wrote it? Uh, I think it went on as I wrote it. You know, I didn't know there needed to be a contrast. It couldn't all be. Right. Um, but I also like I think that at that age, you still don't have your parents baggage. Like they've raised you and you have the personalities and stuff, but you haven't internalized the stuff they've internalized and you don't have their fears. Like the thing about being an adult is they're actually like there's global warming, there's violence, there's an unstable government, uh, there's job insecurity, there's like every once in a while, I don't know you have this, but you're like, is there radon? Should we test for radon? <laughs> like, what, yeah. like how does how does CO leaks happen? Yeah. What? Who put me in charge of a home and children? You know. <laughs> and so, like, you have these things that you have to deal with that make you more anxious and make you more circle your wagons than kids are. And I think kids, you know, they they just even even if if. Uh, their parents are conflict avoidant, they can see their parents for that. And when they grow up, they're going to be conflict avoidant, but they're not yet. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're just sort of more blank slates. And, and I, I do think that like I was hoping to show that people are generally good. I think the circumstances of Maple street uh, were the problem Mm -hmm. more than any individual or even the crowd. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think teens are maybe more willing to forgive other, you know, people their age as opposed to maybe, you know, the parents in this setting for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they're they're just more interested in each other. I think that's, that's that wonder age where you realize um, that you could define yourself in any way you want and you could wear any identity you want. And actually you are separate. And if you want to walk away from your parents and not come back to the next morning, they're going to be furious and maybe they're going to call the cops. You can still do it, you know? Um, I don't know. When you're a teenager, I think you're starting, you're already getting there of like when you're older of where are you going to go to college and what's your life going to be and who are the kids that you're associating with and what do they represent? Whereas as that wonder tween age, I think you're just like, yeah, I don't know. And that's awesome. (laughs) Right. No, definitely. Um, well, so, this is good. You, you're like building right into the questions that I had. So when you brought up, you know, radon and global warming, I mean, how, you know, how do we live with the sinkhole? I mean, I, that's part of the question here. You know, especially the, the kids sort of deal with it one way and the adults sort of deal with it another way. You know, how, how, do, we, how do we live with the sinkhole? Asking for me. How do I live oh, with it? <laughs> you know, um, after I was writing this book, a sinkhole appeared, you know, after – when I came back to it at the bottom of my hill, you know, you've been to my house yeah. like that. So they had to Whoa. shut our road down for six months from nine to five every work day. So they could like fix all the damage. Um, they're just more and more. And they're obviously like for people who don't know, science has made a definitive connection between increasing sinkholes and temperature increases like global warming. Um, how do we live with it? 
you know, I think that change is inevitable and it's as if we've sort of been writing a lot of blank checks and now like the world bank is like, Oh, I'm calling them in. Um, so I think we're just going to have a lot. I don't, you know, I don't think everyone's going to die. I don't think it's going to be, I think it'll be a lot of, uh, infrastructure that we'll have to devote less to, you know, capitalism and mass merchandising of crap nobody needs and more toward how are we going to help people with food insecurity right? Um, and just keeping people with roofs over their heads and keeping an educational system going. Because obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but uh, the more heat you have in a system, the more bacteria and viruses multiply, right. the more pandemics you're going to have. Um so, I mean, it's just a check. And like at some point, I think, you know, whether this administration, I don't want to get into politics, but we, we America might just be the people who are behind and everyone else is, you know, takes the lead on this. Mm. But we're going to start paying it. I don't think there's a way to stop it. And I don't think we're, uh, in a, I don't think we're an incompetent species. So I think that we're going to get around to it. I mean, the, the, there's going to be casualties yeah. a lot, but. All right. Let's try to lighten it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, although I, my joke is let's lighten it up and talk about Rhea. <laughs> um, and I'm going to make this comparison. Not She's because like a comedian. Yeah. <laughs> She's no. like the jokester of this. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about Hannibal Lecter for a second in the, the movie Silence of the Lamb, not because Rhea is not Hannibal Lecter, but in that movie, he's really only ha he only has 15 minutes of screen time. It's like a, a, a an Oscar trivia bit that he won Best Actor, even though he was only on screen for 15 minutes. Oh but like God. his presence, like so looms, you know, after, especially after reading the book a second time, I'd be really curious to go through and try to see how many pages are from Rhea's point of view. Cause it's not, it's certainly, uh, it's probably made, uh, at the most maybe a quarter of the book. I mean, I would say it's even less, but you know, she's obviously, I mean, if we're going to boil it down to antagonist protagonist, you know, I guess she's the antagonist, but I think they're sort of all antagonists, but I don't know. So I'm like, I'm just fascinated by her because as awful as she is, you know, I felt like crushingly sad for her. Um, Thank you. But also like, yeah, I, but, but I mean, she had this power, like the scenes where she was manipulating people was like, oh my God, I mean, she's so good at it. <laughs> I can't stand her, but also like, ah, oh, like, you know, she's not a happy person. It's She's a very lonely person and it's, you know, it's just like the poison sort of just leaks out of her because it's well, in her, it was put in her initially. I don't know, I don't, it's not really a question. It's just, let's talk about Rhea. <laughs> well, so one of the main character rules I, I realized was if you make, somebody good at what they do then they don't have to be likable because people love reading about someone good at what they do so mm. Rhea being like just a horrible gossip yeah. <laughs> but like really good at manipulating people is kind of gleeful I think well it's why I felt gleeful like oh my god this is amazing scene like the first scene with her and the detective where the detective first like figures out oh but he can't do anything about it. And that scene is just so great. I was like, ah, yes. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a little funny, you know, like yeah. I liked Rhea a lot and I felt, um, I felt really sympathetic toward her because I felt like, um, you know, she's, she's a classic narcissist and I studied narcissism a ton. Um, like I, I went, I went into like a huge deep dive because I wanted to figure out what is this personality that people would follow that's still kind of likable and interesting mm -hmm. that can be driven to the things she does? And it's like a classic narcissist. And and they're, uh, they're not happy people and they're like a gaping void. Like they, they have personalities, but they don't know it. They think there's just this mask on top of them, but they've convinced themselves the mask is real. And anytime the mask gets threatened, it terrifies them because they're like, the gaping wound is coming and everyone's going to find out the gaping wound. They're going to see me for what I am. I can't let them see me. And then they also kind of think that they're magic. 
Like they think that they're either way better than everyone else or way worse than everyone else. Like there's so many interesting things they do. Like they won't wait in line at a store, you know, <laughs> like, and I'm like, oh, I, I'm a narcissist. Like, <laughs> like, like, but there's so many things that are just very symptomatic of narcissism. And they, they love the people around them so, so much, except when those people threaten their masks and they cripple the people around them because they don't want those people to ever give them smack because they don't want the mask off. And so narcissists tend to be surrounded by lackeys. Anyway, so Rhea is in this place where she's realizing as a parent that something's wrong. And even worse than that, she's starting to think maybe it's her. And I think that's where the book opens is she has been reaching out to Gertie because she's noticed that Gertie's good with girls. Mm -hmm. And she's noticed that maybe Gertie won't judge her. Like Gertie's like a weaker personality. Also, Gertie's beautiful and narcissists love standing next to beautiful people. Hmm. So, cause they're like, it's me, you know, I yeah. have them. <laughs> um, so she's so into it, um, but it's, it's so terrifying for her at the same time because uh, if she admits that, she has to admit everything she's ever built her life on is a lie and everything she's ever thought is a lie. And her whole past that she's constructed, her entire narrative is untrue. And like some of it's unfair, like narcissists will um, unfairly falsely assess themselves as, as bad people just because they're, they're just so weirdly critical. So, I mean, mm -hmm. some of the things that Rhea does are wonderfully competent. Um, she, picked a, she picked a partner who would never uh, challenge her and would never even try to have any kind of relationship with her. And because it was non-threatening, but it's horrible because she's incredibly lonely. Right. So she's, she's just got no one. And if she were ever to confide in anyone on Maple street to be like, I think I have psychological problems and like, like, and she does, um, no one would, she just, she couldn't stand people knowing that. So she, it, Gertie is just the magnet she's drawn to. And, uh, and then it's threatened. Then she worries maybe Gertie's going to figure it out and tell people about me. And this best friend, this person that I loved is going to do that. And I can't live like that. And so she gets kind of revengey, but she also gets very um, magical in her thinking. Because narcissists do tend to think like, I'm more special than other people. You know, I can't actually die. I can't actually, the things that I do kind of create reality. Um, they also don't, they're terrified of death because death would prove that they're not special. Mm. Isn't it? They're, they're really interesting. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, so what I thought just from like, you know, from your writing side of it, uh, yeah, so that pathology comes through that, you know, oh, she, you know, at first I feel like as a reader, I'm like, okay, I'm very different than she is. But then when it comes to the certain points in the book where she could choose reconciliation and you think, you know, it's there, it's like a, this really human moment where, you know, she turns away from it. And, you know, as a reader, I'm like, of course, like if I was in that same situation, I, even though I'm not a narcissist, I don't, I don't be really hard to, to tell the truth once, you know, or, or, you know, reconcile or be the one to say sorry. Um, so even though, you know, most of your readers, I'm going to assume aren't going to be narcissists, but if you are, that's okay. You can read the book too. Um, she still, I mean, to me, feels very, I don't want to say universal, but like, I don't know. She, you know, she, well, she's very real. I, I, I tend to think that as a culture, we have a little bit of a sickness, a cultural, cultural, <laughs> cultural <laughs> narcissism. Uh -huh. Um, that uh, is just part of like this American end of independence. We're super, we're special. Oh, yeah. We're sort of, and it's not, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't mean that as a value judgment against us. Like, I think it's, I think it's a misdoing of, of capitalism. <laughs> it's yeah. like, like that, but I do, it's, it's this, you know, you've come along ba way, baby, you're so special prove that you're so special by buying these special clothes and the special thing and being special and do better than everybody else by making more money in your career to prove that you're so special, to prove that you're different from anyone else. 
which is um, and really. If you can't, and I'll just say, and if you can't, you're a horrible person. Is sort of the implication, like one of the few cultures where, where, where the poor are looked down as you know most other places in the world, there is wisdom in poverty, right? You, you know, a lot of the cultural stories from other parts of the world, but not in capitalist USA. If you're poor, it's your fault. It's something terribly wrong with you, right? Yeah. 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 It's like you've made bad choices and it's like, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe other people were born with so much more. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's, I, I think feeling this way, feeling like we're both special and helpless, um, is a tinderbox, you know? Mm. Um, and I don't, I don't think it's our fault, but I think that like, as we become a more aware culture and we are like every, every year, every five years, I think we're just coming more aware of what we are as a species and how humans work. Um, I think it's really something we need to counteract. Mm. All right. Well, I'm going to move to our <laughs> lightning round of questions as I'm looking at the clock. We'll end with some, uh, uh so that was, it's a, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was like a. I agree. Mm. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep the you, schedule. I'm the math teacher. Me. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> oh, just so you, I've been reading. Uh, I got a early copy of Shirley, the letters of Shirley Jackson, and the early letters of her, like talking about her dad thinking she's a commie. It just remind. It, again, it's sort of heartbreaking. Like she had some like really uncomfortable moments with her dad over that. It's like, oh, oh wow. man, it was, you know, and, and, you know, she's writing about this in like the, the late, late thirties when this came up, but anyway, let's, uh, let's go the lightning round. So the rules are, you know, these got to be sort of brief answers. It doesn't have to be one word answers, but they are supposed to be brief sort of off the cuff. Some okay. of them are hard. Some of them are Drugs. Rid ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the first one is going to make enemies of somebody for you. Uh, West coast or East coast. East coast. East Coast, represent. <laughs> uh, M&Ms or Skittles? M&Ms. M&Ms. You can, you can <laughs> give like a one sentence elaboration yep. if you want. Yeah. No, okay, so yeah. um, they stick, they're sticky Skittles. I don't like them. They're sticky. Okay. Do you, yeah. do you, like a chocolate. Do you, do you want just regular M&Ms or like all the other weird variants? I do like the peanut M&Ms. I, I like peanut uh, M&Ms. They're okay. a nice snack, but if I wanted yeah. a sweet, I would, <laughs> I would have a regular <laughs> they're a nice snack. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, I like asking a drink question. Wine or beer? Um, beer. Really? And yeah. Yeah. I it's, only say that because I feel like I've only ever seen you drink wine. Like when I've been hanging out with you. Well, cause I'm always like, it's so fatty for me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if I actually look at going by what I actually like to drink, it's beer. Nice. Yeah. Right answer. I, I actually, I don't like wine. Maybe I've never had good wine, but anytime I try it, it always gives me a headache. Like yeah. instantly, like one glass. I'm like, uh. Anyway. I can't right. drink red wine anymore. I haven't okay. been able to for years. Okay. Um, haunting of Hill House or we have always lived in the castle? The Haunting of Hill House. But my, I haven't read We Have Always Lived in the Castle since I was in college. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. They're both great. You can't go wrong. It's, yeah. Okay, so this is partly inspired by your book, and there's a long explanation to this one, so you have to try to stay with me. Uh, so as a parent, it's really hot out, like in the book, you know, especially where you are. It's 100 plus degrees. Kids are driving you crazy. Are you just going to set up the slip and slide, or are you going to commit to like an hour-long drive beach excursion? Yeah, so that's it. It's really hot. you doing it, okay, slip and slide. I'm a, I it depends on the deadline. Like if I'm like, yeah. I'm tired and I have work to do. Like right. I, they're lucky if they get the slip and slide. <laughs> <laughs> but if I'm hot also, <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, then we'll go to the beach. Mm. It just depends on, it's a, it's a trip. And it's a trip and not even like the drive. Like I will admit I was the worst beach parent. So as a teacher, you know, uh, you know, Lisa has been working pretty much, when Cole was born, she was able to for, but after that, she watched the kids. And so I was in charge of taking him to our local pond for swimming lessons. And I hated the the preparation of getting all the beach stuff, getting them there. And because I'm so anal, it's like sand, no sand. I'm like changing them on the beach, you know? <laughs> 
<laughs> I've scarred. I know I've scarred them from our beach excursions. Yeah. I do no prep work at ever, at, like in anything. So I'm like, just get some stuff and we'll go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our narrative ones, so we're like, I didn't like having a ride home with sand. And I'm like, <laughs> How did yeah. you notice it? It's just sand. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we I live agree. a little closer now, so we go. We went to the beach pretty often. Like Malibu is mm -hmm. um, is an hour drive, but it's a pretty drive. Yeah, that's good. I like the beach. All right, this is a good one. Okay. I was very proud of this question: John Langan or Sarah Langan? Sarah Langan. <laughs> yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> sorry, John. Uh, sorry, John. <laughs> uh, just because we're the same age, this is a goofy one. It, it, you could take this any way you want. 80s hair metal or 90s alternative rock? I was a 90s alternative rock girl. Like, yeah. I, I went to Lollapalooza. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, yeah, I, I, I did too. Yeah. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. No, Cause, yeah, because you're like a metal guy. Like you'll well, bring up some bands, and I'm like, I don't know. No, nah, I'm more. Well, <laughs> I like to fashion myself as more '80s punk, that with some '90s alternative. But there got to a point that where '90s alternative got pretty bad. Yes, when it yeah. was like the Goo Goo Dolls, were they alternative? Yes. It was like, yeah, what is yeah, that? right. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. But like, there's still a soft spot in my heart because in seventh grade. I would write Def Leppard in my notebooks in math class. And I had a with, jean jacket with Def Leppard pins. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah. Before I became cool, which was like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if ever. Okay. Oh my God. Oh, that's so this is related to the book a little bit. Ten, so you have a choice between 10 good friends, you know, dependable, 10 good dependable friends or one like soul friend, the kind that, you know, you could tell everything you ever thought you could tell somebody you know, would donate a kidney. But I'm the you, one soul if, friend person. You're the one soul like friend. I'm okay. always, like I'm like it's too many friends to keep in touch with for me. Yeah. <laughs> like I just want my one friend that I can go for a walk with, and I'm like, you're my best friend. <laughs> She's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last one, and it's referencing Twilight Zone. You know, Monsters of Maple Street, or Time Enough at Last, or The Howling Man. So I give you three. Wait, which was The Howling Man? Uh, it's one where the guy's, he's like, I got the devil trapped in the closet. You can't let him out no matter how much he cries. Oh, yes. Okay. I remember that. So Ma Monsters of Maple Street. Yeah. Or Time Enough at Last. That's the, oh, Burgess I can Meredith. read everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I think the Monsters of Maple Street are doing Maple yeah. Street because yeah. I like that one. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, you know, Maple Street is reference to the book. Yeah. Oh, really? The poster? I don't, yeah. I, I don't understand how, how my camera works, but it's yeah. right behind. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, one of our kind hosts is going to come in with, with the Q&A questions for us, I believe. Right? That's Hi, me. Amanda. I am, the kind, I am the kind host. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> the other host, not kind. Not kind. Okay. That's good. <laughs> we have to keep her hidden. <laughs> All right. Um, so we do have some good questions in there. We put them in the chat too. So they're kind of organized there. If you want to look at, I'll okay. let you know what the first one was, but if you want to look, a, you want to look ahead. Um, so the first question was for Sarah. It says, what is your process of selecting point of view when you begin to write a story? Is it intuitive or do you reason it out? Or does the process vary depending on the story? Um, process varies depending on story. Like I just finished uh, a novella called You Have the Prettiest Mask and that was first person. And that was because it was so close and it was it was about a 12 year old girl and the stuff going on in her life. Um, but I think with the story with uh, Good Neighbors, uh, it made more sense to have a lot of, point of points of view. And I always like getting close um, so it, it really just depends. Yeah, you know, one of my questions, I was going to ask you uh, about like the large cast of characters because for, right, the, um, the missing, the, the keeper, I'm terrible with titles. That was the title, right? No? Yeah, the keeper, yeah. the missing, and Audrey Store. Uh, for the first two, was like a, a big cast of characters jumping around. Um, and, and similar to this novel, like Audrey's door, there were less, right? It was pretty much. <laughs> it was pretty much Audrey. And then Audrey, I threw yeah, in yeah, yeah. some other points of view just for, to spice it up. 
Sure. But you do it very well, the, the jumping around, because I can't. I have a hard time. Like, I stick with <laughs> maybe a couple of characters usually. It's a little bit. It's my it's it's a it's a flaw because I I will just write new characters like whenever I'm going to I don't know what to do. Like Raven Chandler was like, you know, have somebody walk in the room with a gun. I'm like, why don't I just develop a new character who lives next door? <laughs> like, like 20 more pages. So it's for me, it's really it's it's honing it. Um, my biggest issue. Okay, the next one was um, also for you, and it was about, would it be fair to say if there is some head full of ghosts in Good Neighbors? Yeah, I think it would be. I think Paul has had an influence on me. I think we've maybe influenced each other, yeah. Well, definitely, uh, uh, on me. And uh, I'd like to say, I'd like to think my my drinking beer is an influence on your choice earlier. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, I, mean, I think both novels clearly have, you know, this concern of like what it means both to be a child and a parent in the now, um, you know, and how the cultural, how the culture intrudes, how media intrudes, um, for sure. I mean, it's hard not to write about it. I mean, I have to try to force myself to not write about it all the time because I essentially did three novels in a row about it, uh, <laughs> you know, then tried to break away a little bit. Did you, you have Boris here? No, I just, yeah, I think, I think it's in the, it's in the water, you know? Um, Just like bitumen, am I saying that right? Yeah. <laughs> am I saying it right? Okay. <laughs> no. I don't know how to pronounce things. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> and and Paul, someone has challenged you to, or has asked a good question here. Could you write a horror novel one day that's entirely <laughs> built on math? And <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I usually get the math question a lot. Uh, like yeah. you're gonna write a math horror novel. I don't know. I mean, it'd be cool. I just haven't had an idea. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Not really. <laughs> it, for me, I mean, the math thing is like so separate from the writing part. And that's why I've been able to keep doing it, I think. It, still teaching math because it, it is not – like when I'm teaching math, I don't feel like it's tiring out the writing muscles. Like if I was teaching English and writing every day, I think I'd be totally exhausted. I mean, I really – respect people who can teach English and writing and then go do their own writing. I think it would wipe me out. Do you, th I felt, so when I was getting my master's in toxicology, I was taking a lot of, you know, math classes and I really felt it was helpful. I was, I had to write the missing at the same time. Mm. And it, and I don't know what kind of magic it did, but I felt like I was able to write a plot better than I had been before. Mm. Did you, I, I think it probably might even help you because it's, it's just so analytical and there's just these pieces that you ought to be looking at as how they fit like a Rubik's cube. Right. But, you know, as an English major, it's harder to do. Sure. I mean, I definitely do think like I approach writing in the way you described, I guess maybe more analytically than some, certainly not all people. Um, I feel like I'm terrible at plot because I'm still more interested in characters and other things, but I do think the math part of me helps me think of like all the possibilities, like I may make the wrong choices as a writer, but like I have considered, I feel like I've considered almost everything, if that sounds weird. Or yeah. Because, um, no. like even the first short story that turned me into like, holy cow, I must read more, was Shirley Jackson, oh, Shirley Jackson, sorry, uh, Joyce Carol Oates's Where Have You Going, Where Have You Been? And when I read that story first, I was like, I didn't know people wrote things like this. Um, instantly, and not that I've ever done coding or anything like that, I was like, oh, this story is in binary. There, there's all these... <laughs> choices there are all is this real is this not like throughout the whole story and i just found it utterly fascinating how she was able to build all this tension by really all these ones and zeros all these yeses and no's i mean i guess there's maybes too um but i don't know so I, sometimes when i'm writing i'm sort of thinking about those different choices and i sort of follow it and you know i may not go in that route but at least i knew what that i know what that route would be like mm -hmm. maybe i don't know yeah, so there's the math for you <laughs> Um, so it's already math is the answer. Yeah, <laughs> you already it's wrote already it. math, right. <laughs> so we had someone ask, is there, kind of back to that question earlier about Head Full of Ghosts, and this is their progression from we have always lived in the castle to Carrie to the Keeper to Head Full of Ghosts to Good Neighbors. I love it. That is a good question. That's a cool <laughs> progression. I like it. I've read all those too. <laughs> <laughs> always good, right? When you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I will so, say, yeah. so I mean, I would say briefly, I mean, definitely we've always lived in the castle because I named, you know, my character 
Mary after, you know, Mary Cat, Blackwood. Um, the the other character who maybe isn't as well known, I want to give him more all the credit in the world because he was a mentor to me when he didn't have to be, it was Stuart O'Nan. Um, I named Marjorie, if anyone's read the book, after his Marjorie and the Speed Queen, uh, which is this amazing novel that he wrote in the late 90s that everyone should read. Uh, it was originally going to be titled Dear Stephen King, but they wouldn't allow that. And actually he met King because of that and they became friends. Because the story is being told by Marjorie, who's a death row inmate. She may or may not have been a, a willing participant in a Charlie Starkweather-esque Stark uh, killing spree. And Marjorie, the novel is told through Marjorie answering Stephen King, asking her questions. And it's clearly King, even though it doesn't say Dear Stephen King, because like when the interviewer is thinking, he's thinking like he mentions Carrie and he mentions uh. <laughs> stuff that King wrote. Uh, but, I mean, the whole book is Marjorie just fucking with him. And it's just so good. Um, so if you're looking for an older book that, you know, I think should have had more attention than maybe, or certainly more than it's had lately is the speed queen. All right. So we have, and then we have some, like just a few questions of our own that we'd want to ask, like just kind of re relative to like how we do stuff at our store. Um, so we've noticed and like a lot more with it, that horror is actually selling a lot better now than it was. And there's like a picked up interest. And so we are just seeing if that's something that is observed across the board and would there be anything driving that? I, or, is, or is there just something going on in our neighborhood? It could be that. <laughs> I, they didn't market my book as horror. Um, thankfully, because I don't think it would have sold as well as it's doing and they couldn't have marketed it to book clubs and, uh, there's so many people I grew up with who like texted me and were like, can I actually read this one? I don't think <laughs> I can. And I was like, you can read it. You know, you're not going to. And they did. And then they were like, I'm OK with it. I actually liked it. I recommended it to my friends. <laughs> and then the parents at my kid's school read it. But if it were horror, they wouldn't have. And they're recommending it to their friends. So um, is it horror? Yeah. But is it uh, is Good Neighbors horror? Yes. But it's also other things, and it's not the visceral horror that people think that they're going to be getting. You know, it's not a Blumhouse movie. Um, it's, you know, a lot of people haven't read Shirley Jackson. So they think that Shirley Jackson is the Netflix Haunting of Hill House, which is, is absolutely not. It's a it's turn of the screw, maybe, but it's more comedic, mm -hmm. um, the books. And her stuff is very much about... Um, she writes from the perspective of like middle-aged women having identity conflict. Like that's her big thing. Like it's kind of horrific to suddenly wake up and be this different person and have, have all these different things you're supposed to be doing in your life. Um, so, so I, I haven't really answered your question, but I, I like, that's great that horror is selling more. Um, Paul, <laughs> to you. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think it, clearly it is selling more, but like, you know, there's still, uh, and not that your publisher didn't market yours as horror because they were afraid of it, but I do think, you know, so many publishers are still afraid of horror and so many, you know, not being punny, <laughs> afraid of horror. Um, <laughs> you know, and so many readers, as you mentioned, are still like, oh, if it's horror, I'm not going to read it because, you know, still, I, you know, the mainstream or most people associate horror maybe with its, you know, worst representatives, usually Hollywood, you know, films. Um, so I don't know. It's weird. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm fine, you know, and happy to be called a horror writer. Uh, but also, like I was in some bookstores recently to sign some books and I noticed, hey, that we have a horror section. I'm like, oh, that's great. But now I'm like, I'm like, oh, I miss the idea of someone just going through general fiction and seeing my book. You know, they're they'd be more likely to pick it up. Um, yeah. As opposed to now they would have to go to the horror section, which is fine. But um, I don't know. It's such a weird, you know, <laughs> baggage laden genre. Um, I love it. You know, and there's things about it, a lot of things about it I, that I don't like, but I'm obviously continually drawn to it. Um, yeah. So who knows how long, like, you know, this, I mean, I think this quote unquote boom will last. I mean, I think clearly we're seeing, you know, more horror being published and stuff like that, but and I, and I, feel like and I, know, I just notice it more like on Netflix, like, like bringing sure. up the house, like, you know, that kind of stuff is a little more mainstream to have it, you know, as TV shows and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, like Mexican Gothic, it's it's definitely a horror novel, but I don't know that it was marketed as what, you know, it was mm. mainstream literary fiction. Right. You know, not, not everything's the cover either, but, you know, the cover doesn't, you know, certainly your cover doesn't scream horror. 
uh, you know, neither does Mexican Gothic, you know, maybe other than the word Gothic, but Gothic exists without the word horror, obviously. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see, <laughs> uh, you know, how that continues or the marketing of it, which again, like, I don't know, Sarah and I have no control over, you know, I'm just happy if anyone buys and reads my book. Um, let's see, some more uh, questions that, um, that we had. And Sarah, we've heard that you take requests for joining book clubs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, this is our novel neighbor book club thing. Uh, can you want to talk about that? What do you mean? <laughs> what <did> we, <laughs> do you take requests for joining them? Like, like, what does that mean to take requests for joining them? Oh, I just have my website. Anyone who wants me to be in their Zoom in there. and is in a book club, I'm happy to happy to do it. Yeah, I, they just have to I, contact me. I think we read like it could it could have been read as like I'll join your book club. Like I want to be in. Oh, book clubs. yeah. I was like, I don't yeah. understand yeah. your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I'm not joining any book clubs currently. But <laughs> half the people just unsigned up. I don't know what happened. Uh. <laughs> You don't want me in your book club. You're okay. You're good. For that. We will end with one like, completely ridiculous question. But that's always fun to ask. Um, if your book was made into a movie, or your books are made into movies, who would you picture as the cast? Oh, that's a good one. I always liked uh, Rachel Evan Wood for Gertie. Mm. Um, like, I've just loved her as an actor. Um, and, you know, I think otherwise... I don't really care as long as they're good actors. I think it would be interesting what they bring. And I think um, they could be, I, I, I like the idea of, of people who are unexpected. So. Uh, when I get this question, uh, cause I get it occasionally, like I'm so lame with it because even though I love movies and watch a ton, it's weird. I don't think about, Oh, who would be in this book? Cause the character looks like, who I think they look like when I write it. And they're sort of stuck that way forever. Uh, what I do think about though, what I wish people would let me do if any movie was ever going to be made, because I want to be in charge of the soundtrack. <laughs> um, I definitely have soundtracks for all my things. So I want to do the soundtrack and, and directors too. Like, I think I maybe think about that more like, Oh, I'd love to have, you know, this director do, you know, see, see what they do with the story. Who would you want? What director? Well, I mentioned Jennifer Kent. Well, the Bob Duke earlier, I'd love Jennifer Kent to do, you know, a head full of ghosts would be amazing or, or any of those other books. Uh, Karen Kusama. I want her. She should yeah. be amazing. Yeah. Well, her, her, like you live sort of in the area of the. the, the yeah. The invitation. Right? Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that thing when you have them. Yeah. Um, so I was going to say, I guess we are out of town. So are out of town. We're out of time. Um, and so to thank you to everybody that was here. Definitely thank you to the two of you for such a good conversation. It was fun to like kind of listen to, yeah, in this new world that we live in where you can just kind of like drop in on two people's conversation. Like that. <laughs> um, it's, it's fun. So if you, everyone else that's watching, if you don't have your own copy of The Little Sleep or Good Neighbors, we have ones available in our store. So please buy and see it. Um, and if, you're outside, if you're outside of St. Louis, um, we're happy to ship them anywhere. So thank you everyone for being here and we'll see you at our next event. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank Thanks you guys so much. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody.